Thank you for joining us today at Hope Church. We exist to connect people to live a life of a Jesus follower. We hope you enjoy the service. Good morning. Man, it's good to see y'all this morning. Y'all doing good? All right. Y'all look good. Y'all look healthy. Okay. All right. All right. All right. Amen. Thank God. Amen. Well, um, I I'm always happy to come. Listen, y'all are family to me, man. I feel the most comfortable here. You know what I'm saying? This spitting section right here. Praise God. Get all this. Um, but this morning, I, I, I want to share something with you. Um, I am more convinced now than ever that if you really want to get to know who, some, who somebody is, what makes them tick, uh, what created their paradigm, for me, there is no greater indicator than to know their family. If you really want to know who someone is, what makes them tick, what, what, what they love, then I think the greatest indicator is to know who and where they come from. And so for me, uh, since that's the case and you're my family, I want you to get to know more about me. And if that's, if that's true, then you have to get to know my family. So there's some pictures behind me of uh, what I call us, I call us Team Harris. There we go, there we go. Um, as you know, my wife, Rose, I call her my chocolate queen. Um, man, my wife is, is beautiful and, and fun and kind and strong. You keep going. Uh, picture of me and my son. His name is Ricky. He's a third. We call him Trip. Uh, but, but that's my boy, man. He loves dancing, man, loves sports. It's really kind. And then my baby girl, my chocolate princess, her name is Ryan, and she, she, she's about two right there, man, and uh, she runs the household. Just let you know that. <laughs> Dads without daughters, you know how that is. She runs the household. But that's my family. I, I call us Team Harris. I love my family. I would do anything for my family. No one comes above my family except you. You, Hope Henderson. Though I love my family with all my heart, I will give my life for them. There's only one group of people who come before them, and that is you, the body of Christ. You come before anything in my life. And I'm pretty sure you're saying, well, Ricky, you know, we enjoy you coming every now and then, but let's be honest, you were not the closest of friends. So why in the world would you put us above your own blood family? But now I'm in Vegas now, and so I see your question, and I raise you a question. <laughs> Y'all got that? It was, a, it, was a, it was a gambling joke. It's okay. It's okay. But I think the better question is, why is it important that we prioritize the family of God above everything and everyone? Is it really true that we are called to place the family of God even above our own family? In fact, Christ asked us this question pretty much in our time today. And this is why this question is so important. If we do not answer it right, it will affect and determine our own relationship with Jesus. So today we'll be in Mark chapter 3, and this will be our last week in the book of Mark because next week we'll start a new series called This is Hope. In our time today in Mark chapter 3, Christ will show us three important things about the family of God, all right? So as you turn to Mark chapter 3, uh, let me kind of set the scene for you. Christ is now famous. He's the most famous person in all the region. His face is on the Israeli TV uh, commercials. His, his face is on the newspaper. People are coming from north and south, east and west, all to be in his presence because he was doing something that no one else could do. He's healing people. He's raising people. He's healing the sick, raising the dead. No one else could do this. People are surrounding him at every moment of his life. And this crowd is diverse. Some are his followers. Some are just spectators. And, pa and last week, Pastor Trenton preached on, and even some are his own enemies, the Pharisees, the religious leaders. For they call him Satan, which is the most egregious sin you can call the Son of God. And his family begins to hear about all this commotion. I don't know if you're like me, but whenever I was out of control, 
my family's going to come and get me. You ain't going to mess up my name. And so his family hears about all this commotion, all this newfound fame, and they decide to come and see him to figure out what's all going on. So now that we've kind of set the scene, look at it with me, Mark chapter 3, verse 31 through 35. It says this, And his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside they sent to him and called him. And a crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. And he answered them, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking about those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. So it says now that Christ is in a room much like this one. He's preaching the gospel. This crowd is what they call eclectic, a diverse crowd. We don't know what the summer selection was that day, but I can assure you whatever he's preaching, he's offering salvation to broken people. Whatever he's preaching, he's offering salvation to those who need it. And now the Son of God is preaching a sermon, and in mid-sermon he hears, Psst, Jesus. He continues preaching. He continues with the sermon, and one last time he hears, Psst, hey, Jesus, your mama outside. <laughs> now, I don't know if you like me, but whenever my mama came to see me, especially in school, you ever get that, ooh, you in trouble? Like, he's in mid-sermon, and they're going, Psst, Jesus, your mama outside. Now, to respect this request, you have to understand the Jewish culture. In the Jewish culture, there was a high, high, high expectation that whenever a superior or your family called you to do something, you dropped everything you were doing and you would come running to them. There was the expectation. In fact, those in the crowd who would have heard this request, they would have expected Christ to stop his sermon, lay down whatever he had in his hands, and to run and to go to them. In fact, um, you need to know that it says that his family, it says that they came. And standing outside, they sent to him and called him. Now, in the New Testament Bible, in, your, in, in the New Testament, which is where Mark is, in the Greek language, which is it's written in the Greek language, this idea of calling, it wasn't like they said, hey, Christ, good to see you. No, it meant that they were calling to lay claim on him. Uh, they, they were saying, um, hey, come here. In fact, it's the same word used in Mark chapter 1, verse 20, when it says that Christ called the disciples. It's a word that I'm laying claim on you, and the disciples say they what? They dropped everything. They're not calling Christ to simply say, hey, Jesus, just want to stop by and say what's up. I was in the neighborhood. I want to stop by and see you want some coffee. No, they're going, hey, come here. I own you. It then says that they were seeking him. This word seeking is used about 10 times in the book of Mark. It has the same idea that they were calling to lay claim on him. Hear me. His mother and brothers were not stopping by to do a wellness check. They were not stopping by to have a brief lunch. They were going, I'm hearing what you're doing. I don't like it. Leave what you're doing and come follow me and come back home. Now, here's my question, Hope Henderson. Don't they know who this is? This is Jesus, the Son of God. He's offering salvation. He's saving souls. He's healing the sick. Why would you ask him to drop all of that and come follow you back to a country town called Nazareth? Well, it shows us now in Mark chapter 3, verses 20 through 21, it says this about his family. Then he went home, speaking of Jesus, and the crowd gathered again so that they could not even eat. Now, here is his family's process. Verse 21 says, and when his family heard it, they went out to seize him, for they were saying, he is out of his mind. Now, his own family didn't even see who he was. His own family 
treated him like the crown. What Christ shows us in this first moment is that sometimes, Hope Henderson, as you and I strive to submit to God and live our life for him, sometimes the very people who will stand in our way is our own family. Now what's crazy is he's honoring God. He's preaching the gospel. He's saving people's souls. But to his family, they were making him uncomfortable. I'm going to talk to you as plain as I can. Christ has called you and I to follow him with all we have. But you need to know that sometimes the very people who have raised us, who have protected us, who have provided for us, and for me, sometimes the very people who introduce you to the faith will sometimes be your biggest obstacle of doing God's will. Now, this is the irony here that Mark writes with. Christ's family, his blood relatives, they're standing on the outside. But strangers who have no relation to him are in the inside. Now, if the woman who raised me is further away from me and a stranger who, don't, who does not know who I am is closest to me, what Christ is doing now is he's simply going to show us an interesting question he's about to ask. He says, who is my mother and my brother? Now that Christ have amnesia, did, 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 did the Son of God have a senior moment? Did he forget who his family was? No. And to some of you, this question may be offensive. He's not being rude here. But what he is doing is he's drawing a line in the sand. He's simply saying, just because you share my same physical DNA does not mean you share my same spiritual DNA. Just because you raised me and reared me does not mean you're about my father's business. He draws a hard line in the sand. Now, I got to say this. This is a hard lesson because we love our family. Christ is not being rude to his family here, but he is drawing a distinction in the line. Again, now, he got to be a bold man. Now, do I have any moms in the house? Now, mamas, now you carried your baby now for nine months. You raised your baby, you sacrificed your baby. Could you imagine your, your, your son or daughter going, who's my mama? <laughs> exactly, exactly, exactly. Now, Mary, his mother, is an earshot away from this. She could probably hear that question. I mean, do you see the tension? Read your Bible and it's emotional context. A mother who raised her child for nine, for care for nine months and gave her all to sacrifice for her child. And you're telling me that I gave my all and you have forgotten who I am? The tension in the text. But Christ is not being rude. I love it. When Christ asks this question, this is an interrogative and rhetorical question. Now remember, the crowd is full of people who don't know him. They're not his physical DNA. They're not his blood family. But he asked the question, in the Greek it means that he gave a searching look. As if he's trying to pierce the hearts and souls of those who are around him. He says, who is my mother and brother? And then it's rhetorical because Christ knows who his family is. But he asked it so you would know who his family was. I love it. He draws a line to say, those of you who assume you're close to me must now rethink. And those of you who think because of your sin and your shame and your lying and your conniving, you think that there is no way to get to me, but now I am opening the door. Oh, the beauty of the gospel. That Christ would sit in a place where no one else is like him and say, I am offering an open door. My family is no longer blood. But my family is about those who have shared my same spiritual DNA. When Christ asked the question, who is my family? 
he's really asking and drawing the line, are those who are closest to me, do they own me? Or do those who do my father's will, are they my first priority? So Christ asks an interesting question. Who is my mother and brother? Really what he's asking is, I need you to to define who is my family. Amen? But our first point, Christ raises an interesting question. But the next point, he's going to answer this question. Verse 34 says it this way. It says, And looking about at those who sit around him, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. Now, let's get back to the scene. Christ's blood family is on the outside. Strangers who do not share his DNA are on the inside. And some of you may be thinking, well, Ricky, is Christ saying that he's done with his mother and his brothers? Is he done with his biological family? By no means. In fact, in John 19, while hanging on the cross, bleeding, Nails driven in his hands. In John 19, Christ would say from the cross, son, behold your mother, mother, behold your son. What he's simply saying here is this. He tells the disciple John, while I'm about to go, take care of my mom. So hear me. Christ is not downplaying the biological family. And husbands, let me come straight to you right here. I believe this is a great picture of what we're called to be. We're called as best as possible to provide for our families after we are gone. And I want to encourage any man in here, make it your business to make sure that when God calls you home, you can still provide for your family. Hang on the cross, bleeding. He thinks about his mother. And also his brother John. I mean, I'm sorry, James. James is the brother of Jesus. At this time of the story, James is not a Christian, but later on he will become a follower of Christ. He would write the book of James and even die for the faith. Christ is not downplaying the biological family, but here it is now. He's redefining Christian priorities. He's redefining Christian priorities. And then he says, here is my mother and my brother. Now, Matthew 12, Christ is in a room now, full of people, but there's a small circle who's around him, and those are his actual disciples. And Matthew 12, he says that he points to them. Now, this is where it gets beautiful, okay? Let's go with me here. The disciples were unlearned men. They were not the people you would consider or want to be a part of your family. They were liars, sinners broken people, and yet the gospel says that Christ would love them so much that he would want them to be a part of his family. Oh, you missed it. That's okay. I said this way. I'm looking full in a room of people who are liars. I know you look nice today, but we all know you're broken. We've all made mistakes. We've all sinned against God, and yet the gospel says Christ will look past that and be so eager to call you and I his family. This is the gospel of Christ Jesus. That God will come down from heaven to earth to claim people who should not be a part of his family pedigree and he will call them family. I told you earlier that if you want to know who a person is, look at his family. Well, I'm looking at the family of God and by looking at you and knowing that you're sinners like me, God must be gracious. God must be merciful. God must be faithful. God must be patient. God must be kind. God must be comforting because his family is all jacked up. (laughs) Now, raise your hand if you're a biological family jacked up. Raise your hand. Anybody? Well, guess what? So is your spiritual family. (laughs) So we're two for two. But all the beauty of the gospel. I know we sit here as if it's not a big deal. But you and I don't deserve to be a part of God's family. Tell me what you bring to the table to make God say, I need you. Don't worry, I'll wait. (laughs) Hear me. We sit here as if you deserve God's grace. And that is my heart for you to see the kindness of God for him to put himself in a situation 
where no one else deserved his love, and yet what does he do? He offers it. 1 John 3 says it this way. He says, what kind of love is this? That we should be called children of God. When John says, see what kind of love this is, John is saying, what country does this love come from? Meaning, this is not any normal love. It's not of the earth. And God will simply say, I see you in all of your sin, and I still call you to be mine. This is the goodness of God. So he says, here are my disciples. This is true. Listen, I love this because what, what, what he's doing here is he's calling those who don't share his same physical DNA but share his same spiritual DNA. He's saying, these are my family. This is true for me and my wife. My wife, Rosie, sadly, she, she grew up in the, um, as an orphan. Uh, um, uh, oh, excuse me, um, in foster care, excuse me, in foster care. And her family was not really around like they should have been. But you know who took care of her? The church. The church provided for her. The church cared for her and loved her and walked with her. People who did not look like her, think like her, vote like her, loved her. The church, this is true for me and my family. We've moved around a lot. And hear me, my biological family, we're really close, but we left them back in North Carolina. I have no physical family here. There is no one who shares my same blood here in Las Vegas. So but when my family comes to see me and I introduce them to all of my friends, including Lance, especially Lance and Christy, they always go, how do you know them? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and I get to share with them. that there were people that God loved so much that he will give them to my family even when we didn't have physical family. And they took care of us. And they prayed for us on hard nights. And they provided for us when no one else was there. You, the body of Christ, you are my family. You may not share the same physical DNA as me. But you have the same heart for Christ Jesus as me. And Christ says, those who have that beat, they are your family. Christ makes it simple. He tells his disciples, he tells the crowd, and he even tells his own blood family outside. The family of God are those who sit at Jesus' feet, who listen to his voice, and who follow his commands. He says, those who do that, they are my family. This is a hard text because we love our family. They provide for us. They've cared for us. Some have even introduced us to the faith. But Christ mixes no bones about this. In fact, in Matthew 10, he would say it this way. He would say, whoever is not willing to leave or love father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Christ makes it clear. Nothing comes before the family of God. But here's the good news. Whenever you give up for Jesus, he always gives it back in return. Mark 10 says it this way. Mark, here we go. Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left houses or brothers or sister or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time, 
houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and the in the age of eternal life. I love this. This is what he's saying. Whenever you give up something for me, I always give it back to you a hundredfold. This is why you and I need not turn back from following Jesus for whatever we have given up for him. He always gives it back. In fact, I love how R. Kent Hughes says it. He says, I like Christ math. <laughs> he does not say 100%, but 100 fold. One house gone, but 100 doors open. One brother in the flesh lost, but a thousand brothers in the spirit whose love is deeper and whose kinship is more profound. Christ says, I know you had to give up a lot to follow me. But by following me, I will always give it back to you in return. Hear me, hear me, hear me. Some of you right now, you have been excommunicated from your families because of your love for Jesus. You may have lost some friends along the way because you followed Jesus. But hear me, though you may have lost some, you have gained a hundred more mothers and sisters and brothers and fathers. Whoever follows Christ, he will always give them back what they've lost here. Christ, hear me, is not downplaying the biological family, but he is elevating the spiritual family. He says, my family are those who sit at Christ's feet who listen to his voice, and who does his commands. Amen? All right, now for our last point, because I'm sweating up here, and these rotisserie lights are baking. <laughs> Never wear cocoa butter when lights are on you. Never wear cocoa butter. <laughs> so, um, I love y'all, man. You don't give me <laughs> Christ asks an interesting question. Who is the family of God? He then answers that question. Those who do and follow him. But now the last point, he will make it extremely clear. The family of God are those who do his will. Now, every family is known for something, right? Some families are known for being adventurous. Some are known for being athletic. Some are known for being wealthy or singers. Some are known for not so good, good things. So we'll leave that on the other side of the table. But every family is known for something. So then the question is, what is the family of God known for? Do we even know what we should be known for? If I ask someone who is not a Christian to walk in here and ask them, what do you think the family of God should be known for, or what are they known for, I wonder what they would say. But in Mark verse 35, Christ gives us the answer. In 35, he says, for whoever does the will of God, he is my mother and sister and brother. Or excuse me, brother, sister, and mother. Now, the favorite part for me of this verse is the word whoever. It's like Christ opens the door and says, it's an open invitation. Whoever. Now, don't forget this. He's in the room for the people who are sinners, liars, cheaters, adulterers. And he has the audacity to say, whoever does the will of God, you can be a part of me. Man, y'all are quiet this morning. This should be good news to you. Because some of you don't deserve, not some of you, all of us don't deserve to be a part of his family. It's an open door policy. He says, Whoever, oh, I love this. This is not the gospel of Christ Jesus. That Christ would say the cross is for all people. There are no stipulations here. Everyone is welcome for those who want to follow me. Whoever, this is an open door invitation that God gives to broken people to simply say, even though those of you who thought you could never get close to me, I'm coming to you. Oh, the gospel message. Those of you who couldn't get to me, guess what? I came to you. But what breaks my heart, Pastor Lance, is that in our sin, we've taken God's open invitation and we've closed it. And because of our sin, our prejudice sometimes, 
where he says, no, whoever looks like me, thinks like me, and votes like me, yes, I will call them my family. But if they do not, then I will not label them as the family of God. I'm going to be transparent with you for a moment. Um, in 2018, me and my wife bought a home back east in North Carolina. Our first house, we loved that house. Now, fellas, I didn't know this, but when you buy a house, you're supposed to do a housewarming party. Did anybody else know this? I didn't know this. I didn't know, I didn't know this. So, I mean, I just spent a, a couple hundred thousand dollars on the house. I'm like, no, come pay these bills. Don't come celebrate. Come pay these bills. <laughs> and then, uh, but the issue wasn't that. The issue was the guest list. I'm from the South. There's a racial history where I'm from. I grew up in an all-black family. We didn't really inter interact with any other races. At this time, I'm working in a predominantly white church. And then I don't want to deal with the tension. The party's coming up. I don't want to deal with the slob remarks or the, the, the weird looks. I just don't want to deal with the racial tension so the night before the party, I tell my wife, you know what, I'm, I'm just going to cancel it. I'd rather have two, two parties. And this is why I love my wife. She said, you're not canceling our party because you're afraid to be what God called you to be. Hope Henderson, if we are the family of God, we have got to be confident in who God has called us to be. In that moment, I was afraid to tell my all-black family that the ethnicities that I used to have a historical animosity towards, they have now become my family. I was afraid to tell them that my family no longer was all black, but now it was a myriad of colors. I failed you. I was ashamed to claim that you were my family. The very one waving the diversity flag, I dropped it. And my wife reminded me that Ricky Harris Jr., your family is no longer those who look like you, think like you, vote like you, dress like you, but your family now are those who do the will of God. Now, I've been transparent with you. You be transparent with me. Has anyone else ever done that? Raise your hand. Thank you for your honesty. Because it's hard to judge people when you sin just like them. And we are going to be the family of God. We are no longer going to be a family based off of what we look like or vote like or think like or dress like. We are the family of God because we do his will. And whoever does his will, they are our family. Sorry for yelling. Um, I love you all. Because y'all uh, allow me to be me and be broken. I don't stand up here as if I've always done this right. The key markers of the family of God are those who do his will. But here's the question. What is the will of God? I want to put it there for you. The will of God is to do what God desires. Now, I've heard this question a lot as a pastor, so as Pastor Lance. Ricky, what is God's will for my life? Just open your Bible. I'm not trying to be rude. I'm not trying to be mean. There's 66 books. Pick one. God is not trying to hide and play hide and go seek with, your, with, with his plan in your life. God is not trying to play hide and go seek with what he desires for you. It's here. We have to read our Bibles. In fact, it's not about us reading the Bible, but the Bible reads us. And that's why we don't like to read the Bible. God is not trying to hide his plan for you. 
open your Bible and read it. It is there. But I do want to give you just some small applications if you do have some questions to what is God's will for my life? Well, I want to put them up here. It's not an extensive list, but it's these three things. The first thing is God desires confession and faith for everyone to be saved. Romans 10, 9, for you to confess with your mouth that Christ Jesus is Lord. That is his first desire for you. Secondly, his desire is intimacy. John 15, to abide in me, to remain in Christ Jesus. Hear me. We do not obey to get into the family of God. Proof that we are in the family of God is that we obey. Proof that I love God, proof that I am in relationship with him is that I obey. And then lastly, it is here, obedience. Christ says in 1 John, whoever says that, 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 that they love God and yet does not obey his commands is a liar. Proof that you and I love God is we obey. This is not workspace salvation here. But proof that I am in the family of God is that I find myself making daily choices that align with his will. Hear me. The longer you and I walk with Christ, he begins to shape and mold our will so that it matches God's will. This, Christ says, those who do the will of my Father, they are my family. But you know what? Um, one of the main ways that we can sin against God is prioritizing our own family above the family of God. And that's called family worship. It's to idolize the family of God. Hear me, and we all do it. All of us do it. And the main way that we can begin to grow out of this sin is by prioritizing Christ first. Matter of fact, 1 John says it this way. This is why you and I should prioritize Christ. 1 John, he says it, that he loved us first. So we should love him first. You, you want to know the key to a healthy family? The key to a healthy, I, I would say the key to a healthy family is this. To prioritize Jesus. Why is that, Ricky? Because Christ teaches us how to love people correctly. People are not to be worshipped. They're to be cared for. We only worship God. In fact, Christ will say this in Matthew 22. When asked, what is the greatest commandment? He would say, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. I love it. Here it is. And we often forget verse 38. This is the great and first commandment. Pope Anderson, Christ makes it clear. This is why we are called to prioritize the family of God is because if God is first in our life, then one way we show it is prioritizing his children. Praise be to God that now when I look out at you, I see my family. Because in heaven, there is no black section. There is no white section. There is no Asian section, no Indian section. There is only a section for those who prioritize the will of God. And if we, hear me, if we are going to be the family of God, it has got to be based on doing his will and nothing else. Guess what? This is the only family that lasts eternally. So if that's the case, we might as well get used to each other. Because we're going to spend all of eternity being around each other. As the band comes, I am so thankful that my wife challenged me that day. Because if she did not challenge me that day, I don't know if I would even desire to stand here. But oh, the gospel message. That Christ would say, I left earth to come down to heaven. To take on your sin. 
and put it on my body and hang on a cross just so that I can bring now together a new family. God died not for you and I to keep our biological, racial, or political lines. He died to smash all of it and to draw now a new people to himself from every tribe, tongue, and nation. And this is the will of God. So if I've offended you this morning, please forgive me. That has not been my heart's desire. But as a preacher of the gospel, I must preach the gospel. Jesus says, who is my family? It's those who prioritize the will of God. So if you're a Christian this morning, I want to offer you two things I want you to do. First, I want you to ask yourself, what is the pattern of obedience in my life to God? Secondly, to confess and repent if you have placed your biological family above these, your brothers and sisters. Those of you who may not be Christians, I would love to introduce you to this family. We're broken, we're messed up, we have problems, but we realize that we serve a God who loves us in spite of all we've done. And I want to let you know that Christ opens the door for you that no sin or no shame that you've ever done can keep you from God's love. He says, whoever decides to follow me.